is Andrea Sant. I'm a professor at the University of Rochester in the David H. Smith Center for Vaccine Biology and Immunology in Rochester, New York. And my primary interest is antigen presentation and CD4 T cells. And what I'd like to talk with you about today is um, the potential for recruitment of memory CD4 T cells that are established by endemic human coronaviruses into the responses to SARS-CoV infection and vaccination. So um, SARS, as probably most of you know, is the causative agent in coronavirus disease, and it has had a huge impact on public health, um, tremendous amount of cases and deaths worldwide. And one of the really interesting things to me is that there's a, a, a vast amount of variability in disease presentation. There's a wide range of symptoms and disease paths um, from severe to life-threatening to asymptomatic. And there's known co comorbidities, which are age and underlying conditions, but there's a, also a high degree of unpredictability that does not track with those parameters. And the vaccine responses are also variable in peak and decay over time. So the premise of our work is that um, a contributing factor for the diverse uh, consequences of SARS-CoV infection and vaccination is different um, types of memory in different human subjects. So the factors that might contribute to the probability and consequences of recall responses to SARS-CoV infection vaccination is exposure to related endemic human coronaviruses, and I'll go over those in a couple slides, what those are. Uh, you need sufficient sequence identity between the viral proteins to recruit pre-existing immunity into SARS-CoV infection. Our hypothesis is that the impact of recruitment of memory will depend on the abundance and functional capacity of cross-reactive T cells established by human coronaviruses. And the challenge, um, which there's very little we can do about right now, is that history of encounter with these human coronaviruses um, is really unknown. So the questions that are addressed in our study is, do people have detectable T cells that react to endemic human coronaviruses? And I'll use this abbreviation, HCOV, to distinguish it from SARS and the other pathogenic coronaviruses. And what we know is that humans are intermittently infected with seasonal endemic coronaviruses throughout life, and there's very little evidence of sterilizing immunity to future infections, and there's no vaccines for human coronaviruses. Therefore, any T cell memory that has, is established will be established via infection with these viruses, and likely multiple sequential infections over a lifetime. So this contrasts to the other uh, virus that we study a lot, which is influenza, where memory is established by both vaccination and infection, and those tend to recruit different types of immunity. So the second question beyond can we find these T cells is how does expression of specific mediators of human coronavirus reactive cells vary across the proteins in individuals within the population? And is there a predictable phenotype of human coronavirus reactive T cells in humans? And we use three mediators, gamma, IL-2 and Granzyme, and what's listed on the slide is the different types of effector functions they have. Um, gamma is probably the most prototype um, antiviral uh, cytokine, but IL-2 is really important for help for CD4 T cell expansion and memory, and it can regulate the germinal center reaction. And Granzyme B is an interest of mine, and it um, can participate in cytotoxic elimination of antigen-presenting cells or infected uh, cells. And so these are the coronaviruses, the human coronaviruses I mentioned. They can be broken coronaviruses on the left or beta coronaviruses on the right. And they were only discovered um, in recent decades. Uh, they have different receptors. One, uh, NL63, actually uses the same receptor ACE2 that's used by SARS. But the other, the betas, use uh, glycosylated uh, glycoproteins on the surface, and another alpha coronavirus on the far left is uh, human aminopeptidase N. And the target cells differ a bit with these viruses, and that could affect 
um, certainly disease pathology, but also uh, the tropism, of course, of the virus and maybe the effector function of the T cells if they're infecting different types of cells where an immune response is taking place. And these are listed here. Um, and what's also quite interesting here is that these viruses can become um, systemic, which is quite different than what we think of with other respiratory pathogens that tend to stay in the respiratory tract. And you may have heard about this with SARS, that uh, virions can be detected in many tissues. So this is a general scheme of the genomic organization. And, and really, all I want you to see from this is that there's many parallels. The overall genetic organization is the same. You have these long open reading frames on the left um, that encode uh, a series of proteins that are proteolytically processed and encode different proteins and um, ORF1, A, and 1B. And then there's structural proteins, which uh, include spike, nucleocapsid, membrane, and other proteins. So they're quite similar huge, and many of these genes control many, many different functions in uh, infected cells, including antagonist and antagonism of the uh, innate response. And these are some of the things that we really don't understand very much about SARS. So the epidemiology is interesting. Infections typically occur first in early childhood, less than three years of age. And infections in these young kids often occurs, occur as co-infections with other respiratory pathogens. There's very li little evidence be beyond early childhood for age-dependent patterns in infection when tracked by multiplex approaches to detect respiratory pathogens. So typically that's done if somebody comes into the hospital and has a respiratory infection, they try to get a sample, and then they screen for many different pathogens. So that's how we know that um, the frequency of infection doesn't change very much, and also when people do intentional screening for human coronaviruses. And repeat infections do occur despite the lack of antigenic drift and escape, arguing for a lack of long-lived protective sterilizing immunity. And some of these studies have been uh, done by other investigators who have looked with cohorts that they sample every six months or year and they come to the conclusion that even within a single season, people can have a repeat infection with a given coronavirus. And then, so the timeline of uh, isolation of the currently circulating coronavirus is fairly recent. And you can see here the, the time of these different um, seasonal ones on the top, the endemic ones, and then the potentially the pathogenic ones that have been identified in humans in different places. And the year of isolation does not indicate how long coronavirus has been circulating. And the big challenge for this was success in isolation and characterization of these viruses because there's a lack of suitable cell types to culture the viruses. And now that we have more um, sensitive genetic tools, people can directly sequence the viruses. Now this shows the emergence, the timeline of the emergence, and you can see that they've been around for a long time. NL63 was many centuries ago, and um, other ones are more recent. So HKU1 was in the 50s. And so you can see that they've been, um, and what they try to do is anticipate or map where these viruses emerged from what animals. And you can see that many came from bats, and then they see it diverging from current um, bat or the animal reservoir. So this just shows, again, the concept of open reading frames as well as structural genes. Primarily, our lab has studied, um, but I'll show you some data on SARS with some of the open reading frames and non-structural proteins. Structural proteins, we give them that name because in viruses, those are the proteins that are seen in the virion. And those are, uh, for SARS and the coronaviruses, spike, nuclear protein, the membrane glycoprotein, and there's a small envelope protein. And then there's some accessory proteins as well as um, uh, open reading frames. So one of the big tools we use to test for T cell reactivity is um, peptide libraries. And some of you may not be familiar with this. And I have a diagram of this, I think, on the next slide, where I'll show you that 
it allows you to detect um, T cells without really knowing what they're going to be specific for. Um, it's just a comprehensive um, set of uh, peptides that basically uh, represents the whole open reading frame of um, the translated protein. You can see here for SARS, what you'll see in, in our studies for the coronavirus as well as SARS, is we divide operationally the um, SARS or the spike protein into S1 and S2. That gives us equal sized pools. And these are also functionally distinct regions of spike. And this just represents this type of overlapping peptide library, where you can see they span um, typically for MHC class 2, which is uh, the MHC molecule or HLA molecule that activates CD4 T cells. Those are typically 14 to 18 MERS, and MHC class 2 uh, can accommodate rather large peptides because the binding pocket of HLA is uh, open at the end so the peptide can extend out. I'll show you a schematic on the next slide of what those peptides look like. For MHC class one, they're typically much smaller peptides, so you can use smaller peptide libraries, and those are um, because the peptide binding pocket of MHC is closed. And they can recall any specificity, and this is particularly good because um, you know, you'll see and you may have heard people trying to use um, predictive algorithms, which are based on trying to anticipate what peptides are presented by a given MHC. But one of the hallmark features of MHC or HLA is the incredible genetic and structural diversity. So there's hundreds of these molecules and people will express anywhere from eight to 10 different HLA class two molecules and a slightly smaller number of HLA class one molecules. And so what I just want to review for you when we think about T cell recognition is how do antigenic peptides bind to MHC class II molecules and how are they presented to T cell receptors? Where is sequence relatedness relevant for T cell cross reactivity between these viruses? And this just shows you um, just examples of how um, the gray is the MHC protein. And this just shows you how the colored segments show you uh, how the peptide resides within the peptide binding pocket, MHC class 2 or MHC class 1, where you can see a somewhat larger pink occupancy of the peptide in MHC class 2. And for, for the purpose of our discussion, you can see on the right that there's somewhat limited, I mean, it's amazing the degree of discrimination that takes place because you can see for many of these uh, T cell receptors, only a couple, two to three amino acids in the peptide are recognized by the T cell receptor. And then facing down is the MHC context, uh, contacts, which are sometimes called the anchors. And those can be dominated by three to four different ones, and often one dominant one. So this just shows you the, the type of sequence identity that might be needed and the degree of permissiveness if the, if the amino acid variation is quite um, similar to the original one, you might get cross-reactivity. So it's not any substitution, and certainly non-conservative changes you would guess would be less permissive. So here's just, all you need to see from here is sort of the concept of uh, sequence identity. And here, yellow is um, different among the four coronaviruses and stars, and black is identical. And all I really want you to see from this is that, that if you look at the spike, on the right, you can see the bottom is S2, and that just has more regions of sequence identity with the human coronavirus and SARS. So the options for that and nucleocapsid also has some of those. And then I'll show you a little bit uh, later that within a given family, so if I looked just at the beta coronaviruses, which SARS is, there might be uh, more sequence identity with SARS, but you can see they, they really are quite different from each other, but there are segments that could theoretically allow memory established by these human coronaviruses to be recalled. And um, this is an example of uh, the subjects that we use in our studies, and the, it's a basic assay setup. And you can see on the right that we give each subject a different symbol. 
um, you know, squares or circles, and these are all different colors, and they differ in age and sex, and those are the things that we recover um, and record in our studies. And uh, this allows us to track the same subject from reaction to reaction. So if somebody reacts prominently with one coronavirus, does it also react really robustly? And I think these are more valuable. They're kind of challenging to make for the people that make these graphs, but I think it does make it easier to, to really understand these responses. Our PBMCs are from healthy subjects, and this is a really important point in looking at our data. All the data I'm going to show you were collected before 2019. So there's going to be no people that were infected with SARS in our subjects. There's no history, history of respiratory infection for six weeks prior. Uh, we deplete and eliminate CD8 and CD56 and K cells so that the only cytokines we detect are from the CD4 T cells. And there's also antigen presenting cells in the culture. And LA spot assays are used to estimate the number of cells secreting the mediators in response to distinct peptides. And we plate these T cells at a sufficiently limited dilution such that each spot represents an individual T cell that's responding to those peptides, one of those peptides or potentially more. And so our data is represented as the frequency of cytokine producing cells per million um, CD4, essentially CD, CD4 enriched populations. And this again just illustrates the point that we're going to be studying the structural genes primarily and we incorporate, these are the, the uh, mediators we track, and we have several um, controls that we typically track. One is flu B because it's something that we find in most human subjects, memory to flu B is probably the most pronounced, and we look at uh, the structural genes indicated here. And in many of our studies, we use a negative pool of peptides because sometimes peptides are suppressive um, in culture, maybe because of the organic solvents that are used. So the first thing I'll show you is in these subjects collected prior to 2019, when we test with uh, S1 proteins from these uh, endemic coronaviruses, you can see that virtually everybody in our panel, and all these are different people as indicated by the symbol, um, have re detectable reactivity. Um, and it's what this indicates is learning from the epidemiology is that everybody's been exposed we can't infer from here, like that the high person, you can see like NL63, the blue square person in the far right, that they were most recently um, infected because people, the longevity of people's antibody responses is really quite variable. But this says that there was contact with them. And you can see what the S1 protein that we use, that's the most distinctive on the bottom schematic there. And here's the T cell reactivity. Now, if we look at the total and the um, antigens are at the bottom, these are the seasonal coronaviruses. The um, betas are on the left and the alphas are on the right. And you can see here that there's a tremendous range in reactivity. And this was very surprising to us because we assumed that most people have been exposed, you know, multiple times. So we really didn't know what we would find when we did these assays. And you can see gamma, IL-2, and granzyme. And so we can detect all these mediators. And when we looked at individual subjects, even though you can't see it from here, virtually everybody had CD4 reactivity when, you, when using um, these mediators to these CD4 T cell reactivity to these um, coronavirus epitopes. So this is putting the whole peptide pool into our LE spot assays. You can just see the tremendous range in reactivity. So that's the kind of thing we were sort of wondering about, is it variable and is the phenotype variable? And one of the ways, and I'll point this out later, but you can see, for example, HKU1, the second one in there, if you look at, is the phenotype the same? You could look at the gamma, the top for HKU1, the second one in, has sort of modest reactivity by gamma, but it tends to recruit a lot of granzyme production. And so that tells us that the phenotype of the cells that could be cross-reactively recruited into the response to SARS vaccines or infection um, could be quite distinct in different subjects. And now we break it down into S1 and S2, and you can see that, again, the tremendous range. And one of the things that we noticed here was that um, when we looked at the alpha coronaviruses, there was enrichment in reactivity to S2 over S1, 
And this was more pronounced in the alpha coronaviruses boxed in blue compared to the beta coronaviruses in, in sort of orange. And we were surprised at that because peptide pools are about the same size and we didn't know why they were enriched. Um, so this again help, this is where again we come back to our idea of looking at sequence identity. And what we saw from this where we're comparing the betas um, identity with each other, and again, black is the same and yellow means they're different. What you can see is that the betas have are distinct really from um, both the S1 and the S2, whereas the alphas have much more um, sequence identity in the S2 domain. And this may be, uh, this may allow cross priming. So if a person got um, infected sequentially with NL63 and um, 229E, sequentially, over a season, over the next season, those two infections could cross boost each other, and that would enrich the boosting you would think would enrich for reactivity. You'd expand those T cells, and uh, they could persist. But also, if the functionality of the cells is different, those cross-reactive um, infections could change the phenotype of the cells within the lineage. So, is the uh, functional potential the same among the cells? I've already sort of hinted that it isn't. And this is one way that we've looked at this. And I mentioned to that when we looked at the intact SARS. And what you can see here, and I've just boxed the um, beta coronaviruses. And what you can see is if you look at gamma on the top, that they're, you know, within the error of the experiment, they're pretty similar. But then if you look at Granzon, you can see that, that some OCS, OC43S1, has almost no granzyme is produced in response to those epitopes, whereas there's a lot of these cytotoxic cells with cytotoxic potential in HKU1, and particularly with um, S2. And this is really intriguing to us because when we think about what cytolytic T cells can do, it will depend on where they go. If they go into the lung, those cells could potentially eliminate virus-infected cells, and that would be good. If they go into the lymph node, those cytotoxic cells could potentially go in and actually eliminate antigen-presenting cells or B cells, and that would be bad for the immune response. So we're intrigued by this, as well as just the, the overall difference in the phenotype among different subjects. And this is another way we represent it. We, we, we represent it as ratios within each person. So we look at, in a given person, what was the ratio of gamma to IL-2, granzyme to IL-2, or granzyme to gamma, and really, all I want you to see from here is that it's different among different subjects. Um, the ratio, so it basically means the population of cells that are reactive to these viruses will be different. Um, and the way, the reason we do it as ratios is because this allows us, whether the ratio is two to one or 20 to one, doesn't really matter. It's just you are, you here, if you do it within a subject, you can sort of normalize for people that were either high responders or low responders. And you can see generally what are the tendencies but if you look at the y-axis. And you can see here that relative to um, gamma on the far right, there's generally fewer granzyme producing cells in most people, but not all people, because equal numbers would give you a ratio of one. And um, many are below that, but some are above that. And why might these functionality be different. It could be the number of infections over a lifetime or cross-boosting as we discussed. It could be co-infections with other respiratory pathogens. And because, remember I mentioned that the kids can get co-infections and it's possible that if a child had a co-infection with a particular bacteria or virus, that microenvironment in the lung could imprint the functionality of, of CD4 T cells. And that could persist by recall during the course of the lifetime. And then across viruses, uh, tropism, different receptors, which could affect, of course, the cells that are um, presenting antigen to the T cells, as well as the microenvironment of the T cells where they're being primed. And now we want to look at, is there evidence, now that we know that there's memory, to SARS? And entering SARS peptide pools into the assay, and you can see, yes, among these subjects, there's many people who have reactivity to SARS proteins. If you use gamma, you can see nucleocapsid is particularly prominent. S2 is also prominent. That's on the, the left, the, the uh, gamma. And less with um, the uh, 
uh, membrane and uh, envelope protein. And so this says that there are, even in people that don't have any SARS infections, you can see that they would have potential, the potential ability to respond to these epitopes. Um, interestingly, the, um, the spike seems to have no production of granzyme, whereas nucleocapsid does. And we don't know the reason for that. It's part, possible that nucleocapsid tends to carry some viral RNA along with it when it's priming T cells, and maybe that's why it has more granzyme, but we really don't understand this. And one of the big difficulties in dissecting the mechanisms responsible for this variability in phenotype is the lack of good animal models. Um, for the diversity of human coronaviruses, the, the receptors are not the same in human and mice or ferrets. And also, it's very hard to model uh, repeated infections over time because most of the animal models, the animals only live for a couple of years. So you can't really mimic a 50-year-old person who's had 15 infections. And then when we do a larger fraction of, um, uh, we now look at the whole proteome, and this is just preliminary data, you can see that there's reactivity in these pre-2019 um, samples, and they tend to be uh, enriched for some over others. And this is just gans granzyme, or sorry, gamma that we've done so far. And we sort of operationally for the this large graph uh, presented as large proteins or uh, small NSPs. And you can see, and this is again something I don't understand, we don't understand yet. You can see there's occasional people like the yellow circle person or blue circle person that has high reactivity to all of these. And none of these people have had um, SARS as far as we know, unless there was some circulating in 2016, which we don't know about. But there's some people that just have high levels of these and other people that have very low cross-reactivity. And we don't think this is due to general selectivity of MHC because, as I mentioned earlier, people have a lot of MHC proteins, and there's a lot of um, peptides that they could have responded to. So this is really fascinating, and it could reflect, could be reflected in the outcome of infection, the different inherent reactivities that people have with SARS. And this is another way we look at the data. We call this immunogenicity because this normalizes for the size of the protein. So some of these uh, proteins in the previous representation were sort of penalized because they're tiny. So they don't have a lot of epitopes. And here we've just normalized for the size of the protein. And you can see here that um, there is some proteins that seem to be more immunogenic. Um, and you can just see this by the height of the average or the really high responders in this graph. And we use the word cross-reactivity to explain um, why we think there's cross-reactivity to SARS. And to test whether or not this was valid, we just compared reactivity to the same scheme where black is conserved. We sort of made selected peptide pools that were highly conserved versus not in the nucleocapsid, which offers both types of epitopes. And you can see here with this selection that um, in fact, the ones that we judge to be conserved, and none of them are absolutely conserved, but the ones that are conserved between um, coronaviruses, the endemic ones, because these are SARS nucleocapsid peptides, those tend to, the uh, conserved ones tend to recruit more. So we think um, our conclusion is that the reactivity we're detecting does, as well as the sequence identity, does correlate with um, sequence identity in the peptides that um, could recruit uh, the same set of T cells. And this is um, basically the last data slide. It just shows you something unexpected that we found, which is that in looking at uh, coronaviruses, and you can see all of them here, there is um, an age-dependent decline in the circulating levels of T cells specific for this, um, these either S1 on the top or S2 on the, on the bottom. And this was very surprising because we've been studying influenza for a long time. And you can see on the far right here, the HAB reactivity. And there's really no, um, we really don't see. If you looked at very, very elderly people, a 90-year-old, you, you know, you might see um, because immunosenescence takes place. And so one of the things we don't know about is although people are, there's no evidence for 
age-dependent declines of infection over time, what could be going on here is that maybe in older people the T cells don't boost so much, or maybe they decay more, leading to an overall less robust circulating level. Um, but again, this could affect their susceptibility to SARS because they would have fewer cross-reactive cells. And so our conclusions are, do people have T cells reacted to endemic coronaviruses? Yes, and it's enriched in most cases for um, S2 and S1. How does expression of different cytokine cells? And it's, there's tremendous population level uh, variability. And uh, there's patterns of abundance re related to age as well as functional potential that's linked to a large extent, but not exclusively to the protein specificity of the T cells. And they might have, a given person might have many T cells specific for uh, S2 when measured by gamma, but but little if you measure IL-2. And the consequences and reasons for this are not known. And there are people that have obvious CD4 T cell memory that could be recruited to SARS. And our future directions are to understand the origin and mechanisms that lead to uh, the differences in functional potential of CD4 T cells. We're looking to extend the age groups and separately query beta and alpha coronaviruses and also memory to other respiratory pathogen. And we want to look at um, those, the actual recruitment of these cross-reactive cells in uh, SARS-CoV vaccinated infected subjects. And we've collected some samples now that we can look at. And then the last thing, I want to thank the people in my lab who've done this, primarily the ones that are in bold and circled on this photo. Um, from left to right, or <laughs> left to right on the photo is um, Maria Glover, Chantel White, and Katie Skelly. And um, we've collaborated on a lot of these studies with Paul Thomas and Jeremy Crawford and Katie Allen at St. Jude, and these are our funding sources. Thanks very much for your attention. I hope you've learned something that you didn't know about CD4 T cell memory to human endemic coronaviruses and SARS. Thank you.